examples, and Ahab is our good example of a bad example tonight. King Ahab. Most of us know the division that happened as a result. Excuse me, let me adjust the sound just a little bit. The division that happened with God's people, Israel, as a result, actually, of Rehoboam and his rebellion, uh, or his, and uh, actually Solomon, and the fact that two of the kingdoms of Israel that it were called Judah were left with Rehoboam, whereas uh, the ten of the tribes of Israel became Israel, or became known as well as Ephraim, the capital city of Israel would have been Jezreel, and of course the capital city of Judah would have been Jerusalem. And tragically, God's people, the twelve tribes of Israel, were oftentimes aligned politically against each other and were actually enemies. A lot of times when we talk about Israel, uh, we don't distinguish what group we're talking about. Uh, generally speaking, uh, Judah, of course, the tribes, the two tribes that became Judah had more legitimacy. And why would that be? That would be because of the promise that God made to David that there wouldn't fail one to sit on his throne, and ultimately that being a prophecy of Jesus Christ. And so there were no messianic prophecies for Israel, but there would have been for Judah. Uh, but again, it's a little confusing for us because the twelve tribes were all the sons of Israel, or Jacob, whose name became Israel. So it's, it's helpful for us to have this perspective. If you were to read through the Old Testament, you'll see the king of Judah and the king of Israel sometimes fighting each other, sometimes aligning each other. And uh, But this evening we're going to look at one of the kings of Israel, and his name is Ahab. Now, most of you, I think, probably have heard the stories about Ahab. But I want to read a couple of verses this morning, this evening, in the beginning of chapter 20. And let's just begin at verse 1. We're going to see about Ben-Hadad, the king of Syria. So here we go. And Ben-Hadad, the king of Syria, gathered all his hosts together. And there were thirty and two kings with him, and horses and chariots. And he went up and besieged Samaria and warred against it. And he sent messengers to Ahab, king of Israel, into the city, and said unto him, Thus saith Ben-Hadad, Thy silver and thy gold is mine. Thy wives also and thy children, even the goodliest, are mine. And the king of Israel answered and said, My lord, O king, according to thy sayings, I am thine and all that I have. And the messengers came again and said, Thus speaketh Ben-Hadad, saying, Although I have sent unto thee, saying, Thou shalt deliver me thy silver and thy gold, my wives and thy children, yet I'll send my servants unto thee tomorrow about this time, and they shall search thine house and the houses of thy servants, and it shall be the whatsoever is pleasant in thine eyes, they shall put it in their hand and take it away. All right, we're going to pray. We're going to ask the Lord's help. Father, I pray that you would help us to see your hand, and I, I pray that you would help us as well to, in many ways, see the evil that's in Ahab. God, not as something that is an anomaly in an individual, but as something that we're capable of. I pray that you would help us now in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, one of the reasons for a series of good examples of bad examples is, of course, ultimately to take warning from the evil or from the bad results. If you're a young person, one of the best things that you can do is to have a daily schedule of reading Proverbs. Why? Well, because Proverbs was written to the young man in order to help him to be wise, in many ways, it was an experienced King Solomon who God had given a divine wisdom to, relating the failures of his own life for an example uh, for a young person to avoid the same pitfalls. It's ironic to me as Solomon warns the young man about the women of ill discretion. And it's ironic to me that if you look at Solomon's life, that the very things he warns his son about are the things that were his own failures. And he knew what was right, and yet he didn't do it. 
I've met many people in my life that they would say this about themselves. They say, I just have the kind of personality that I have to learn from my own mistakes. You ever met that I have to learn from my own mistakes person? And truly, we do have to learn from our own mistakes, don't we? It's important, it's imperative for parents when their children are very, very young to give them enough consequence from things that aren't major life problems so that they learn from their mistakes. Let me share one with you, if you will. When I was a youth, a very youthful youth, as in I would have been three or four, and my little brother would have been a year and a half younger than me, uh, we hated the same things that I hate now. That is to go shopping with my mom at a pattern or fabric store. There's nothing worse you can do to children than to take them to Joanne Fabrics or back in the days when Kmart had a fabric department or Hobby Lobby. Those places, I think, were designed by individuals that hated men, period. They just they say that it's a man that owns Hobby Lobby. I scarcely can believe it. I don't know how a man could be part of something like that, but those places, in my mind, are pure evil. One of the agreements in our marriage, a couple things that my wife had for an agreement, I'm not supposed to have a motorcycle because she doesn't want me to get killed. And so I try not to have many motorcycles uh, in, in our marriage. So I, that's my part. And she's not supposed to make me go to Joanne Fabric. That's like two things. When I see the Joanne Fabric coupons in the mail, I don't throw them away, but I want to. I put them on her desk, and she doesn't go to Joanne Fabric at nighttime because my wife's not allowed out after dark. I don't let her go out after dark. Now, I know she cheats sometimes, but she's really, that's kind of the rule in our house. You don't go out after dark. Why? Is it because she can't handle herself or take care of herself? Well, it's partly that. It's also because it's no fun for me to be home worrying and wondering where she's at, so I just don't let her. Okay, okay. So, anyway, that's one of our agreements. Um, so she goes in the daytime to Joanne Fabrics, and uh, occasionally, a couple of times in our marriage, I have had to wait in the parking lot. I've taken her there, and I've stayed in the parking lot. And the best thing to do, men, if you arrive at a situation like that, it's just personal advice, this is for free, is get yourself an RV, and then just go camp in the parking lot while your wife's in there. <laughs> so if you ever get married and you are faced with this dilemma, learn from my experience. Or you could go in that place and find out for yourself what's so terrible about it. Okay, but having said that, I, you know, you may tell that, be able to tell that I was emotionally scarred as a youth. My mom was a seamstress, sewer type person, always sewed everything. She made all of my sis sister's dresses. I have a shirt that my mom made me today. You all ever see the Chevy shirt with the uh, Chevy trucks and cars and stuff on. People are always like, cool shirt. And I say, thanks, my mom made it. And uh, so I have stuff. I have a John Deere apron uh, that my mom made me. It's, it's manly for a man to wear an apron if it has John Deere on it. That's acceptable. Another tip for you guys in case you run into similar circumstances. Anyway, so when I was a child, uh, we were at Kmart one time at the pattern thing. Now thinking about it from the perspective of a four-year-old and a three-year-old or maybe a three and three quarters year old and two and a quarter year old, however old we were at the time. We were somewhere, uh, I was younger than five for certain. Uh, there's nothing more terrorizing to a child than being in a fabric department. It's just awful. You remember when they had those things that looked like file cabinets, but they were desk? And you could sit on like a bar stool kind of a thing and open up the patterns and look at them. My mom was like in heaven in those places. Now, a three or four year old can't see the top yes. of that desk. So what's there to look at? Steel. I mean, you can look at the doors of the cabinet. Now, there's another thing about us uh, when we were kids, and that is that we were not allowed to be hoodlums when we were with our parents, which is why I'm so bad when I'm not around my parents, uh, just in case you're wondering. Uh, but uh, we were very well behaved. Matter of fact, we used to go places and people used to remark to my mom, your children are so well behaved. How do you make your children so well behaved? Well, you just try to kill them when they misbehave and they'll learn from their mistakes. Okay, so anyway, uh, we would have to stand quietly. Well, this particular Kmart in the particular row we were on in this one instance had 
uh, say if, and I don't know, distances are so much bigger when you're a child, uh, so much greater. When you go back and look at a home you lived in or whatever, it's so small compared to how large it was when you were a kid. Uh, so anyway, but say this is the desk over here, and this is the aisle that runs along it. There's a wall here, and there was luggage on the wall. And so my brother and I quietly were looking at the luggage because I'll be honest with you, the cabinet wasn't interesting. <laughs> So we're looking at the luggage, and it had a miniature padlock. Now, they're commonplace today, but when I was a kid, I'd never seen one before. You know, the little cheap padlocks that you can open with, just put a little wire in there, and it'll pick it and open it if you're into things like that. So I had a little padlock, and we found a padlock on a piece of luggage, and my brother and I were playing with it, and that padlock ended up at our home. I don't know whether we deliberately stole it, I don't know whether we, I don't think we accidentally stole it, uh, but we stole it. The next morning, we would do this thing where we would run in and jump on my dad when it was like a Saturday morning, and Daniel and I ran in and jumped on dad, and we had this padlock we're playing with, and dad and mom were there, and his dad said, where'd you get this padlock? And uh, I don't remember, we said something like they gave it to us at Walmart, at Kmart or something like that, <laughs> you know, anyway. Uh, we stole it. Four-year-old and uh, two-and-a-half-year-old, whatever. My brother's a bad influence on me. He always has been my entire life. That's my life. So. <laughs> so my mom called Kmart, and she started crying on the phone. I don't want my kids to go to jail. And, you know, and so she had a conversation, probably with not the person at Kmart, and uh, she talked to them, and supposedly, now my mom, see, my mom lied to us, trying to stop us from stealing. Think about this. Okay, so supposedly the person that came out said, no, no mercy, those boys go to jail. So my mom took us to jail, took us to the police station, and uh, we went inside, and the nice police officer showed us the jail, took us in, showed us, you know, the, how the thing, you know, unlocked and where you go and all that, and put us in it. I was gonna lie. We were gonna be incarcerated for four. And <laughs> You'd go to jail for doing this today, okay? Uh, <laughs> so we're in jail, and they decided to let us go that day. They said, "You know what? If you ever do this again, this is where you're going. But we're gonna let you go this time." And we were very terrified, and then we had to go to Kmart, apologize to the manager, and listen to the lecture, and uh, give the padlock back, and. Uh, that was a pretty good experience that I never want to repeat ever again. Okay? Now, that's learning by your bad experience. Now, listen, kids. If you don't want to go to jail like I did, just don't ever steal anything. Okay? And you'll never... It was traumatic. You're laughing, but I would tell you, you wouldn't be laughing if you were in jail. It wasn't funny when you're four years old and they slam the door shut. I said, that, that door's loud. It's not just going in behind the bars. The door's loud and scary. Everything's scary in jail. So anyway, you don't need a tour of jail when you're four years old if you don't steal. So don't steal. Now, there's two ways to learn that lesson. You can learn it the way I did, or you can learn it from listening to me telling you. You get it? See, you don't have to go through what I went through as a four-year-old to say, I better not steal. There's a God in heaven that sees you, and you'll never get away with anything ever. So you better just do right. Okay, I know people that say, Pastor, I just have to tell you, I'm just the guy that I have to, I just can't learn from listening. I just have to learn by experience. Let me urge you, change your mind about that. Life will be easier if you can read what God says and obey it and do right. You want to become a thief? You'll have major consequences. You don't want to control your temper? You'll have major consequences. You want to be a liar? You'll have major consequences. You'll learn if you survive. But it's much easier to learn by listening to a bad example than it is to learn by being the bad example. So that's our perspective as we're in this series right now, there's a lot of profit from looking at things that were not right and saying, that isn't right. 
And then looking and saying, okay, what made that that way? And saying, okay, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. It's not going to be me. I'm going to, I'm going to do right. Ahab was just wrong, period. If we were to read previous chapters, we'd see about uh, Ahab and Baal worship. Who delivered the nation of Israel out of Egypt? God did. But Jeroboam and his, uh, and his successors erected golden calves and said, these are the gods which brought you out of Egypt. Baal uh, was a pagan god of the land. That was one of the reasons that they were supposed to drive out utterly the inhabitants of it. And worshiping Balaam was uh, common practice. And Elijah the prophet had spoken up against Balaam, but Ahab had married Jezebel, and she wanted to worship Balaam, and so Ahab stood up for his pagan wife instead of acknowledging God. I'm just tell you, folks, God's God. You can worship a false god, but God will still be God. And so, if you were to read the previous chapters in 1 Kings, you'd see about how that the prophets of Balaam were given a challenge by Elijah. And Elijah said, I'll tell you what, let's do. Let's find out who God, who really is God. If Balaam's God, then he can do supernatural things, right? So he said, you call on Balaam and you said, offer a sacrifice to Balaam on the altar, but don't put any fire. And you ask Balaam to light his own fire. Call for Balaam to let fire from heaven call. And his prophets of Balaam, they, they, they chanted and they danced and they prayed and they did everything they could. They cut themselves to try to make Balaam feel sorry for him or see their sincerity in their worship to him. And no fire came. And then Elijah said something like, dig a ditch around it, fill the ditches full of water, and there had been a famine. Uh, there had been no rain. Elijah had prayed that it would not rain because of the idolatry. And uh, Elijah prayed and fire dropped from heaven. It burned up the altar. It burned up the sacrifice. It burned up the water that was poured on it. And it burned up the water in the ditches. It was serious business because God's serious. God's real. And uh, Jezebel said, I'm going to kill you to Elijah. And he ran for his life. And you'd think that Ahab could have learned a lesson from that, but he didn't. Now Ahab is besieged by Syria, by Ben-Hadad. Ben simply means son, so the son of Hadad. Uh, Benjamin, or Ben-Hadad is besieging. He's got these massive armies, massive troops all around the city. And he sent a messenger in and said, everything you have is mine. Your gold is mine. Your silver is mine. Your wives are mine. Your children are mine. And Ahab sent him a response saying, yeah, you're right. Everything I have is yours. What a coward. And so then they sent a message back saying, tomorrow at this time, tomorrow at this time, I'm going to come and anything you like, I'm taking. Anything you have that you like, I'm taking. And Ahab got just a little bit upset. Let me ask you a question. Did God have any sort of obligation to deliver Ahab, a wicked, godless, Baal-worshipping king? Did God have any obligation to do anything for Balaam? Well, this is interesting. Look at, if you will, verse 13. Um, well, let me, no, no, I'm sorry. That's, that's, too, that's too soon. Okay. In verse 10, Ben-Hadad sent unto him and said, The gods do so unto me, and more also, if the dust of Samaria shall suffice for handfuls for all the people that follow me. And the king of Israel answered, I love this, and said, Tell him, let not him that girdeth on his harness boast himself as he that putteth it off. He said, well, put your money where your mouth is. Why don't you brag after you've done it, not before. That's verse uh, 11. Verse 12, It came to pass when ben had heard this message as he was drinking, he and the kings and the pavilions, that he said unto his servants, Set yourselves in array. So get ready to fight. And they set themselves in array against the city. Verse 13. And behold, there came a prophet unto Ahab, king of Israel, saying, Thus saith the Lord, Hast thou seen all this great multitude? Behold, I will deliver it 
into thine hand this day, and thou shalt know that I am the Lord. And Ahab said, By whom? And he said, Thus saith the Lord, even by the young men of the princes of the provinces. Then he said, Who shall order the battle? And he answered, Thou. Okay, so a prophet came to Ahab and said, God says that you're going to get to fight the Assyrians, Ben-Hadad and his armies, and God says He's going to deliver you. And Ahab said, who's God going to use? And he said, the princes, the kings around you, the people that are under you, your, uh, the, the, the people that you know. And Ahab said, who's going to lead them? And, and the prophet said, the prophet of God said, you are. Now, we have to be good enough, we have to be honest enough to see, look at the good things about Ahab, don't we? Remember when uh, the prophet of Judah, I mean, sorry, when uh, the king of Judah had the prophet go to him and say, ask anything of the Lord, and he said, I will not ask, you know, I'm not going to tempt the Lord God. Well, Ahab, one of the redeeming qualities, we're going to see a couple of redeeming qualities and characters, characteristics in Ahab. One of the redeeming characteristics of Ahab was that at least he had enough humility to know when he was in trouble. He's the guy that when Naboth's vineyard, when he had stolen, had Naboth murdered and gone down to the vineyard, he's the guy that was sorry about it. And when God told him he was going to die, he was scared, he was afraid. And so he asked God to have mercy on him. Uh, in this instance, he doesn't deserve God's mercy. And yet God has said, I'm going to deliver you. And he's asking God questions. How are you going to do it? And he's actually willing to let God deliver him, interestingly enough. Now here though, Ahab is a good example of a bad example because Ahab knows who God is. God is a real, true, living God who created the world and who is the actual God of Israel. And yet Ahab worships Balaam. It's really confusing actually. It's really confusing because Ahab knows what the truth is and yet he responds basically to the greatest show of force. When he's forced to worship God, he will. But when he has a choice, he won't. Listen to me, my friend. The test of your character is not what you do when you have to. Do you hear me? The test of a man's character is not what he does when he has no alternative. The test of a man's character is what he does when he has the ability to choose between right and wrong, good and evil. See, Ahab, when God said, go and have the victory, Ahab said, I'll go and have the victory. What choice does he have? He needs God. He needs help. He doesn't really have a choice in the matter. And so he's a guy, he's a king, who's supposed to lead a people who makes a good decision when there's no bad decision. Or when the bad decision's a lot worse. Christian, don't be the kind of a person that has to have terrible consequences for doing evil in order to do good. Grow out of that. Grow out of that. It's one thing when a child doesn't have the character in him to do right for the sake of right. And his parents have to make consequences so that right becomes better or easier than wrong. It's one thing for a child. But I'll tell you, if you don't grow out of that, you'll be a King Ahab where I worship God if God will deliver me, if no one else will, and if I need God's help, I'll turn to God. Well, that's not really saying or giving much, but we do have to give uh, Ahab credit for that. Now, here's what happened. So in verse 15, the Bible says, that he numbered the young men of the princes of the, two, of the provinces, and they were 232, and after them he numbered all the people, even all the children of Israel, being... 7,000. Okay. Uh, 7,000 is a larger crowd than will fit in this room. But compared with chariots and horses, this isn't much. Here's what happened. Uh, in verse 16, they went out at noon, but Ben-Hadad was drinking himself drunk in the pavilions, he and the kings, the 30 and 2 kings that helped him. So he had 32 kings helping him. Uh, Ahab had 32 princes. 
Verse 17, the young men of the princes of the provinces went out first, and ben sent them sent out, and they told him, saying, There are men come out of Samaria. And he said, Whether they be come out for peace, take them alive, or whether they be come out for war, take them alive. So ben said, Take them alive. Don't kill anybody. Well, that's not a very good way to fight, actually. Now <laughs> you think about this. Now let me ask you a question. Who confounded the wisdom of ben God. He's He's drinking when he's at battle. And the Bible says he was drunk, so he's drinking strong drink. So he's besieging a city, and while he's besieging the city, and he's the one making all the decisions for his military, he's drunk. And he said, take them alive, boys. If they come out for peace, take them alive. And if they come out for war, take them alive. I don't mind telling you that's dumb. Uh, someone coming to fight you is not coming, you know, in a neutral position. I tell people all the time, you don't want to get in a fight. Because when somebody's fighting you, they're trying to kill you. It's not very intelligent to try uh, to capture someone who's trying to kill you. <laughs> it's like, you know, it, it, it's like trying to fight fire with gasoline. It's just preventing, an op it's just, you know, um, adding fuel to the fire. So that's his first decision. In verse 19, So these young men of the princes of the provinces came out of the city, and the army which followed them, and they slew every one his man. <laughs> Go figure. And the Syrians fled, and Israel pursued them, and ben the king of Syria, escaped on a horse with the horsemen. So it didn't go well for ben but he got away. Verse 21, And the king of Israel went out, smote the horses and chariots, and slew the Syrians with great slaughter. Now, Verse 22, And the prophet came to the king of Israel and said unto him, Go strengthen thyself in Mark and see what thou doest, for at the return of the year the king of Syria will come up against thee. So the prophet of God comes to Ahab again and he said, Get yourself ready for a real fight now because he's coming back. You got him by surprise, but this time he's coming back and he's serious. Okay, now look at verse 23. And the servants of the king of Syria said unto him, their gods are the gods of the hills. Therefore they were stronger than we. But let us fight against them in the plain, and surely we shall be stronger than they. And do this, take the kings away, every man of his place, and put captains in their rooms, and number thee an army, like the army that thou hast lost, horse for horse, and chariot for chariot. We'll fight against them in the plain. And surely we shall be stronger than they. And he hearkened unto their voice and did so. So now Ben-Hadad has these advisors who said, you know, the only reason they won was because their God's the God of the hills. We were in the hills, and they had the hill God on their side. And, you know, God can't leave the hills. Their God can. He's stuck in the hills. And so if we get them to come down into the plains, then they'll be godless. Not in the sense that we use the word godless, but their God will stay in the hills, and then they'll be in trouble because their God doesn't travel. <laughs> This is similar to take them alive to me. I mean, this makes as much sense. Now, let me ask you a question. Who is confounding the wisdom of this mighty king of Syria? Who's confounding the counselors of this mighty king of Syria? Is there a mystery? It's the God who's not the God of the hills, not the God of the plains. He's the God of the world. He's the God of the universe. He's the God who made the universe, who created it. And it's amazing, isn't it, how intelligent sometimes our conspiracies and our thinking and our plans are. And it's also amazing how God just confounds them and just makes us, in our intelligence, absolutely foolish. And that's what God did for ben -Hadad. Uh You know, if I ever have to go to battle, I want to fight guys that God's doing this to. That's, that's all I can say about it. Okay. Now, in verse 28, there came a man of God and uh, spake unto the king of Israel, and said, Thus saith the Lord, Because the Syrians have said, The Lord is God of the hills, but he is not God of the valleys, therefore will I deliver all this great multitude in thy hand, and thine hand, and ye shall know that I am the Lord. Okay, now look at verse 29. They pitched one over against the other seven days, and so it was. And the seventh day the battle was joined, and the children of Israel slew the Syrians in hundred thousand footmen in one day. But the rest fled to Aphek and into, into the city, and there a wall fell upon twenty and seven thousand of the men that were left. 
So they ran to a city, and the wall fell on 27,000 of them. Now, who did that? Ben and Dad, did he tap hard? No, God did. Just like the wall of Jericho fell on them. Okay. In verse 31, And his servant said unto him, Behold, now we have heard that the kings of the house of Israel are merciful kings. Let us, I pray thee, put sackcloth on our loins and ropes upon our heads, and go out to the king of Israel, peradventure he will save thy life. So they girded sackcloth, I mean, verse 32, on their loins and put ropes on their heads and came to the king of Israel and said, Thy servant ben and dad saith, I pray thee, let me live. And he said, Is he yet alive? He is my brother. Excuse me? Many times I have observed men who are familiar with who God is think that they are more merciful than God is. And this is a good example of that. It's a bad example. But it's a good example of a man thinking he's more merciful than God. Who wanted to avenge Ben-Hadad? Ahab or God? God actually did. Why? Because he said that he's only the God of the hills. And God said, I'm going to teach Ben-Hadad and everyone in the world a lesson about who God is. But Ben-Hadad had the bright idea of, well, his advisors did, and they gave him pretty good advice here. They said, uh, if we go and surrender to the king of Israel, they'll have mercy on us. So they go and surrender to the king of Israel, and the king of Israel says, Brother, this is the guy, if you remember, that said, Your gold and silver, they're mine. Your wives are mine. Your children are mine. Anything I want of yours, it's mine, and I'm going to come and take it. And Ahab says, buddy, buddy, boy, brother. Why? What's the motivation? You say, Pastor, I can't think of a reason. I'll tell you why, because a lot of times men think that in what they think is mercy, that they're more merciful than God is. And that is precisely Ahab's vantage. He thinks, you know what, I'm going to be merciful. I'm going to show mercy. <laughs> A guy who lacks mercy applies mercy in the wrong place. It's a misapplication of mercy. And so Ben Hadad makes the or uh, I mean, sorry, Ahab makes the decision. Um, and, and now they become buddies. Look at verse 33. Now the men did diligently observe whether anything would come from him and did hastily catch it. And they said, Thy brother Ben-Hadad. Then he said, Go ye, bring him. Then Ben-Hadad came forth to him, and he caused him to come up into the chariot. In verse 34. And Ben-Hadad said unto him, The cities which my father took from thy father I will restore, and thou, shalt, and thou shalt make streets for thee in Damascus, as my father made in Samaria. Then said Ahab, I will send thee away with this covenant. So he made a covenant with him, and sent him away. My friend, never make a covenant with the enemy of God because when you make a covenant with the enemy of God, you have sided against God. Did you hear me? When you make a covenant with God's enemy, you've sided against God. Do you think God is delivering Ahab because of Ahab's righteousness? No. God is delivering Ahab because he is collateral to Ben-Hadad's blasphemy. And that's the only reason why. And yet Ahab in his foolishness makes a covenant. Makes a covenant with Ben-Hadad. Ben-Hadad said, you know all the cities that my father took from your father? I'm going to give them back. And you know how, do you know how uh, my father made streets in, in your city? You know, and named them after himself? We're going to name a street in our city after you. And Ahab said, deal, man. Good. And was satisfied with that. But that isn't what God told him to do. God said, I'm going to use you to destroy the Syrians. So he made a covenant. Ben and Dad and Ahab made covenants one with another. Now, let's think about it logically, because sin is never logical. But it seems, you know, like, oh, okay, so, you know, we've got a, treat, a treaty, we've got a truce. It's a good thing. Let me ask you a question. 
Did Ben-Hadad's giving the cities to, Ab to Ahab signify anything at all, actually? Okay, if you're a dead man, what do you have to give? If the king of Israel destroyed you, trounced you and your armies, who do the cities belong to? <laughs> Israel. Ahab had them. Ben-Hadad wasn't giving him anything. He had already taken those cities. There's nothing to give. It's nonsense. Ahab's a fool. If you keep a man alive who threatens your life, and you keep him alive when he's in a position of weakness, what will that man do when he's in a position of strength? You already know what he did in a position of strength. He'll turn on you. He'll kill you. Ahab's a fool. He's a good example of a bad example. And I want to ask you a practical question. What was wrong with Ahab's brain? What was wrong with his brain? His pride. What was wrong with his brain was that he was not right with God. It's amazing how that the wisdom of men who are not right with God is absolute foolishness. And Ahab is absolutely not right with God, and God's done so much for him. He's privileged. He has been given, literally handed, a victory. He's been not only delivered, he's been handed victory. What's wrong with his thinking? Well, it's very easy for Ahab when he doesn't need God to forget who God is. You know, people do that all the time. Godless people make ungodly decisions. And that's basically the same as saying foolish decisions. And that's precisely what he does. And so the prophet comes to Ahab. Let's speed ahead, fast forward just a little bit. And in, here's a great story. It's, it, and it's related. Verse 35, A certain man of the sons of the prophets said unto his neighbor in the word of the Lord. So he, he said it to him in the word of the Lord, Smite me, I pray thee. And the man refused to smite him. You ever met one of the hit me in the stomach as hard as you can guys? Mm -hmm. I remember when that happened one time at my dad's radiator shop. A guy came in, he's a great big guy, and he said, Hit me in the stomach as hard as you can. My dad said, I don't want to hit you in the stomach. He said, Hit me in the stomach as hard as you can. My dad said, I don't want to. He said, Come on, hit me in the stomach as hard as you can. And so my dad pulled back and slugged him as hard as he could in the stomach. And the guy goes, he just starts screaming. Aah! And then he said, oh, you pinched my belly and my belt. <laughs> he hit his, hit his belt and it pinched his stomach fat and he was screaming. I guess he had pretty good abs, but not a very good skin. So, <laughs> <laughs> There are those people, aren't they? So this prophet said to another prophet, and he said it by the word of the Lord, he said, hit me. Hard as you can, smite me. And the guy said, I won't smite you. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to hit you. And But but God had told him to. So in verse 36, Then said he unto him, Because thou hast not obeyed the voice of the Lord, behold, as soon as thou art departed from me, a lion shall slay thee. And as soon as he was departed from him, a lion found him and slew him. That would be another good example of a bad example. We don't have time for it tonight. Verse 37, Then he found another man and said, Smite me, I pray thee. And the man smote him. So then in smiting, he wounded him. Now, why did the prophet do that? Well, here's why. Verse 38. So the prophet departed and waited for the king by the way and disguised himself with ashes upon his face. And as the king passed by, he cried unto the king, and he said, Thy servant went out in the midst of battle, and behold, a man turned aside and brought a man unto me and said, Keep this man. If by any means he be missing, then shall thy life be for his life, else thou shalt pay a talent of silver. And as thy servant was busy here and there, he was gone. And the king of Israel said unto him, So shall thy judgment be, thou hast thyself has decided. So he goes by, Ahab's passing by, and this prophet pretends that he was in battle, and he said, I was in battle, and this guy had a prisoner, and he gave the prisoner to me, and said, keep this prisoner, if you lose him, then you're going to forfeit your life, or you're going to have to pay a talent of silver. And he said, and I was busy working, I was fighting, I was doing my thing, and he looks like he's been in battle, because he's been hit in the face, and he's got ashes on, he's a mess. And and so he looks like he's been in battle, and the king said, whatever they said to do that, do it. You should have kept your prisoner. You should have done what you were said. And then he wipes his face off. He cleans his face off. And in verse 41, he hastened, took the ashes away from his face, 
And the king of Israel discerned him that he was of the prophets. And he said unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, Because thou hast let go out of thy hand of whom a, part, a, a man whom I appointed to utter destruction, therefore thy life shall go for his life, and thy people for his people. And the prophet said to Ahab, Because you didn't finish the job, you're finished. Same as you told me. Ahab was met with the same standard of judgment with which he judged. Similar to, you remember, uh, when King David uh, was, was approached by Nathan the prophet when he murdered Uriah and sinned with Bathsheba. And he, he said, you know, that man is worthy of death. And Nathan said, thou art the man. This guy did the same thing. Okay, so now Ahab is going to meet judgment. Now, that's sort of the end of this story. We see Naboth in the vineyard. And uh, we see, we know we're not going to look at that this evening. We know the end of, of Ahab. But I want us to look at God now. We've looked at Ahab quite a bit this evening. And I'd like to look at God. First of all, I want to say that though Ahab thought he was more merciful than God, God is incredibly merciful. And Ahab wasn't close to approaching God's standard of mercy. I'll remind you that in 2 Peter chapter 3, uh, in the early days of the church, there were individuals that scoffed and they asked the question uh, about, about uh, the Lord Jesus are coming to judge the wicked. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lust and saying, where is the promise of His coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. For this they are willingly ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. But the heavens and the earth which are now by the same word are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord is a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slack concerning His promises, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us word. Not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. I've met people that said, if there's a God, why hasn't He judged me? Why hasn't God done something? You know, the, the earth's just going round and round, and it always has been, and it always will be. And the Scripture reminds them the earth came into existence by God's Word. And that earth which came into existence by God's Word, the waters flooded it and it was destroyed. God spared a man, Noah, and his three sons and their wives. And God promised He'd never destroy the world again by flood because the next time God's going to destroy the heavens and the earth with fire. And they're going to be consumed in their entirety. That's future judgment. And men say, if God's going to burn the world up, why hasn't He? My friend, if God had destroyed the world, you wouldn't have survived. That's why. Because God is long-suffering. The Bible says the Lord is not slack concerning His promise. God's going to destroy the world. Listen to me tonight, my friend. Judgment's coming. God is going to destroy the wicked. You naysayers that say, why doesn't God do something about evil? My friend, evil's going to burn. The whole world's going to burn. This earth is going to be judged for the iniquity in it. God's going to judge the world. People say, why hasn't He done it yet? Why not? Because He's merciful, my friend. Because He is merciful. Why did God deliver Ahab? Because He's merciful, my friend. God is merciful. Why did Ahab allow Ben-Hadad to survive when God wanted him destroyed? Because he thought he was merciful. He thought he was more merciful than God. It's incredible how men can get their thinking skewed. And at the same time that they think that God should judge people they don't like, they think God should ignore judgment for evil and for rebellion. And my friend, God's a just and righteous judge. And you oughtn't, and I oughtn't, to put ourselves in the place of judging him. And that's precisely what Ahab did. For that, he was a fool. My friend, God is very merciful. God was merciful to spare Ahab's life. And God is merciful today uh, to spare each of our lives. God was merciful in sending His Son 
so that we could receive Him. And yet today, individuals levy similar claims or similar accusations against God when they say, why does it have to be God's way? Why does God get to pick the only way for eternal life? Why does it have to be Jesus? And they're speaking of the Jesus who came and died for them because God loved them. And that's insane. Does God have the right to choose how He will be merciful to us? My friend, He chose judging His own Son. And we think He shouldn't have that right. Oh, how foolish. God's more merciful than we are. I want to look again, though, just at the end of Ahab's life. And I want to just finalize it by seeing how merciful God actually was. In verse 25, uh, I'm sorry, uh, chapter, let's see. Yes. No, 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 no. I'm, in the, I'm in the wrong place now. I wanted to... Ah, can't find, okay. In verse 28 of chapter 21 is where I meant to look. Actually, look at 27. It came to pass when Ahab heard those words that he ran his clothes and put sackcloth upon his flesh and fasted and lay in sackcloth and went softly. This is when God told Ahab about his destruction. He was going to be eaten of dogs in the field of Naboth, whom he had murdered. Verse 28, the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite, saying, Seest thou how Ahab humbled himself before me? Because he humbled himself before me, I will not bring the evil in his days, but in his son's days will I bring the evil upon his house. I'm amazed by that statement, actually. You know when Ahab deserved to die? Not very long after he became king of Israel. I... My mindset is there's nothing redeemable in Ahab. There, the, the man has such terrible character. But the one redeeming quality Ahab had was the ability to humble himself. He humbled himself when God came. God sent the prophet to him and said, you're going to be delivered. And he said, how? And he did it God's way till the end when he didn't feel like he needed to do it God's way any longer. And in this instance, he's murdered. He's been you know, complicit in the murder of Naboth, and he knows that Jezebel had Naboth murdered, and he took his vineyard from him. And God said, you're going to die in the field that you stole, and dogs are going to come and eat you. And he got upset about it because he actually knew that when God said something, it was God. And so he humbled himself, and he put on sackcloth, and he had ashes. The Bible says he went softly. In other words, there, there is no party in Ahab. He took it seriously that God said he would die. And God told the prophet, he said, see how Ahab humbled himself? I'm going to be merciful to him. He said, it's not going to happen in his days. It's going to happen in the days of his son. And I'm amazed at that, my friend. I'm amazed at the fact that God showed mercy to a man like Ahab because he certainly did not deserve an iota of mercy, did he? Not at all. Let's make some application, then we'll go home. I've never deserved mercy either. Have you? <clears throat> when I sin, do I deserve God's judgment? What did I get instead of God's judgment? Jesus took my place. I didn't deserve that. So many times in my life, I've felt this way. Have you ever felt this way? I felt that when I have sinned and when I have failed God... I just felt like, God, I'm worthless. You gave so much for me. You gave your son for me. I'm thankful for that, but God, it was a bad investment. I am a failure. I am not worth... You've, done, you've been so good to me. You've been so gracious to me. But God, I'm just not worth anything. I'm no good. God, you ought to just kill me. If I were you, God, <laughs> I'd say... I'd pinch me, you know? Pop my head off or something's done, gone. That's the way I feel about it. And you know when I've humbled myself before God, the Bible says it this way, and I found it to be true. If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And my friend, that's just always been God's character. 
And that's a good lesson we can learn from Ahab. Here's a good example of a bad example. He worshipped idols. He was willing to do anything he could get away with. He, when God delivered him, he gave away the victory. He was a fool. But the one area where Ahab was actually a good example was that he humbled himself. And what we learn by Ahab's humbling himself is just how merciful God is. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever humbled yourself? Have you ever bowed to God and acknowledged your need for a Savior to begin with? My friend, no one taught you to be a liar. No one taught you to commit adultery. No one taught you to steal. No one taught you the evil that you've done that you and God know about. It's in your character. And by your nature, you're God's enemy. And yet God gave His Son, judged Him in your place. Have you ever humbled yourself and acknowledged your need for a Savior? You know, people go to hell all the time because they simply will not bow to God. And Ahab at least had that ability. He at least had the ability to say, you know what, I'm in trouble and I need a Savior. And you know, a lot of people just bow up. And they won't bow. Just say, uh-uh, I'm not bowing to God Himself. Pharaoh tried that. A lot of people have done that. My friend, God's still God and you're a fool if you won't receive Christ as your Savior. Foolish. Sometimes as believers, man, I'll tell you something, God's just really good to us and we just really take His goodness and abuse it. And you know, we know based on the character of God that He's merciful. And you know what we need to do? We need to bow. We need to confess our sins. God, my sin is what you say it is. I confess it. I'm asking forgiveness for it. And the Bible says that if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It's tragic the way Ahab lived his life. But it's wonderful that there's the God who Ahab knew was really the true and living God. And it's a wonderful thing that he's also a God of mercy. And I hope you learn that from Ahab's good example of a bad example. Thank you, Father, for what we've learned this evening. Increase the truth of in our hearts and our lives. Help us to see characteristics and similarities where we're like Ahab. And God, I pray that you would just help us to see our need to humble ourselves. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You're dismissed.